So we're ready to start with our second panel of the day, uh, which will deal on uh, with the issue of community aspects of developing a high-speed rail system in California. And uh, we'll explore some of the key lessons to understanding and responding to community needs. And um, this panel will be moderated by someone who knows a bit about that. He's, uh, he leads one of our uh, partner organizations, uh, SPUR. Gabriel Metcalf, uh, is, he is the Executive D Director of the San Francisco Planning and Urban Research Association. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so guys, this is gonna be really hard to get high-speed rail built, right? Let's, let's, let's just acknowledge the envy we feel when, when our friends come back from China, they've been in Shanghai or wherever, and they say, God, they built 10 high-speed rail lines in a month, and, and during, during that time, we've managed to hear like part of an appeal on a CEQA document, and 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 in this in this epic struggle between dictatorship and democracy, democracy is not uh, is not holding its own right now. So I I think that's that's sort of the framing I want to give around this. It's not just China though. It's it's also there's such a contrast between the American way of infrastructure planning, and Western Europe. When, when I, I, I know you all have had this experience. If you talk to colleagues who come out of a more European um, planning tradition, they are astounded at the kind of populism of America's civic culture, at the disdain for expertise that, that uh, is so deeply rooted in America. You layer on the culture of property rights, the the localism and, and complete absence of national or state oversight over local planning. Um, the, in California, you layer on the need these days to make so many of the big decisions at the ballot, the, the, the paralysis of the legislature at, at a both state and national level. You layer on these problems and you realize if you are an opponent of a big infrastructure project like high-speed rail, you are in fertile territory. There are just so many ways you can stop, delay, block, or draw out the process of designing and paying for a system like high-speed rail. So the, the topic of this panel, community aspects of developing a high-speed rail system in California, it gets to the core of the challenge of whether we're gonna be able to do this or not. Um, and it's, it's very important that at a gathering like this, we face these issues head on. Um, I know we're preaching to the choir within this room, but that's okay because this is where we formulate our strategy to go out and preach to the people who are not the choir. And, and frankly, I think we have to acknowledge that right now the opponents are, uh, they've won a series of victories, so this is very serious. Um, our speakers, our panelists will be Michael O'Hare, Professor of Public Policy at Berkeley, Lisa Schweitzer, Associate Professor, the School of Policy, Planning, and Development at USC, Julien Donois, thank you, uh, uh, Vice President at SNCF America, and Mike Burnick um, from HNTB. So um, with that, uh, Michael, start us off. So um, I'd like to give you the good news about politics of high-speed rail. Unfortunately, I don't have much. Someone else will give you the good news. Which clicker am I supposed to click with? Is this the right thing? Wow. Uh, so here's, um, here's what I'm going to try to go over. Uh, if I can do it quickly enough, I may come back and, and add some bells and whistles along the discussion that, that are peripheral to this uh, sort of the track I'm trying to stay on. I also try to stay away from rail metaphors. Um, what's, this, what's the strategic structure of NIMBY disputes? I'm going to talk about NIMBYs that stands for not in my backyard. There's a whole bunch of other versions of this phenomenon, Lulu, locally unwanted land use. Um, among my favorite uh, is a NIMTO not in my term of office, which is pretty important here. 
um, banana, build, any, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. And uh, finally, a NOPE. Uh, NOPE is a project that uh, stands for Not on Planet Earth. Um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, I'll talk generally about the overall strategic structure of the NIMBY problem, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how that comes out in the, in the real context. This is, a, this is something I spent a fair amount of time on early in my career, and then it went away and didn't bother me. And it suddenly came back this year, uh, partly for this conference, and Blas, Blas asked me to talk about this, and I said, geez, I, I certainly hope I have time to catch up with all the research that's been done since I last looked at this. It turns out there hasn't been that much um, a really important progress, which was a relief. And then in the Blue Ribbon Commission on Nuclear Waste, on Nuclear um, Energy uh, called, and they asked for a similar paper. Uh, this is the easy one. Um, the easy NIMBY problem to deal with compared to nuclear waste. Uh, talk a little bit about compensation and the uh, and the uh, the other traditional responses to the or conventional responses to a NIMBY dispute. Uh, how to get a project to go ahead. Um, and try to um, emphasize the issues of process legitimacy that have turned out to be most important in resolving these issues. And then I want to talk a little bit about the issue of uh, leadership and political leadership in this context. Okay, so what's, what's the basic, basic outlines of a NIMBY? Uh, we're talking about a project that is, oh, I should mention, sometimes you find in the literature a NIMBY is used to describe a person who opposes some good project because he doesn't want to be near it. Then you're just being a NIMBY, and that kind of, that's not the way I mean it. I'm using it to refer to the, to the um, proposal and the dispute surrounding it. Uh, so what's important about it? Uh, the first thing is that it's beneficial. It's beneficial for society at large. It's not beneficial. <laughs> Let's not do it at all. Let's not have an argument about whether we should build it near somebody's house. Um, so I'm going to assume, and, and this is not, is not at all a settled issue, I'm going to assume that we do want to build a high-speed rail system in California of some sort, settled in another, that dispute is settled in another uh, venue. We've heard a lot about it, um, economic benefits, social benefits, and so on uh, uh, yesterday and today. And the beneficiaries of this project tend to be many, and they each tend to have small stakes. That it's not really important for anybody in particular in California that we have a uh, high-speed rail connection or not. For example, if you live in Redding, I guess you don't care whether it's or much how easy it is to get from San Francisco to LA. And in fact, most people in San Francisco won't be getting on the high-speed rail to go to LA. Um, on the other hand, it's going to be very beneficial in a broad way for the economy of the state as a whole, if it is. Um, then on the other hand, this is going to be perceived as costly for people near the project. So these are geographically specific, geographically specific um, uh, projects. There are a few of these locals. They are known to each other, and the stakes for each of them is high. High, for example, you could lose your house if the, if the um, highway department comes along and takes your property to build a road through it, you're gonna move, and that's pretty costly. And what's important about these is that, this, that adding up costs and benefits does not predict the outcome of the dispute because the small group with high stakes always has a strategic advantage, and that's a structure that's been detailed in Mansur Olson's Logic of Collective Action, which is the seminal work in this area. All right, so what do we do about situations like this? There's, this, there's a project that's gonna, be, that's gonna be pretty good for a lot of people who are spread out across a geographical area. It's gonna be pretty bad for a few people who live near where you're trying to build it. They seem to be winning. What do we do? So the original approach was, it's been characterized as decide, announce, defend. You, and this is kind of Americans' view of the European procedure. A legitimate government makes a decision. Everybody says, oh, well, okay, you know, we elected them, so I guess, they're, I guess they have a right to do that. And they say where it's going to be, whatever it is, and then people say, no, no, it's a bad idea, and then you argue with them and win the argument and go ahead and build it. So when that works, I guess it works, uh, but it often doesn't work. So next solution is that the problem is getting the legal right to proceed. These are, these are being fought out in court, so let's make sure that we really have good, um, uh, good lawyers working on uh, taking problems and getting all the right permits and everything. 
And very often that doesn't work, and the mode of failure is that you face a parade of women with babies and baby carriages in front of the bulldozers. You have a legal right to proceed, but you don't have, it turns out, the political capacity to actually do it. Uh, well, let's do better engineering. Let's, let's really go back and study this and study this and prove that it's very low risk. And one important thing I'll mention about the, about the, the NIMBY issues in real is that it's not mostly about risk. And that, in some ways, is, may make it a lot easier to deal with compared to nuclear waste siting, for example, which is that people are afraid of being hurt. <clears throat> um, so let's do better engineering. That turns out not to be sufficient either, although you have to do all of these things. And finally, let's buy the right to proceed. Let's have conditional compensation. If we build this project and the value of your property goes down, or if you just don't like it, we'll pay you something, a new gym for the high school, maybe cash payments, and then you'll feel better about it. So what does this look like? Um, I'd invite you to think about a project neighbor's decision tree, not the project advocate or the developer's decision tree or the government's decision tree. It's much more illuminating to think about what would it take for somebody who's likely to get in the way of this train to step off the tracks. And that person is making an analysis that looks something like this. I can either go to the public hearing and give $10 to the Community Defense Fund and oppose this project and vote for the mayor who says he's going to try to stop it, or I can accept that it's going forward. And uh, there may be some costs along either path. How's, how are things going to unfold? If I oppose the project, um, I'll fail. The project will go ahead and get built. And then with these probabilities, with this probability, with these probabilities, there'll be a good or a bad outcome. Or I'll succeed. And things will be as they were, except that I wasted all that time in hearings. But I did get to meet some folks and eat some brownies. and. Um, if I accept it from the start, I face this probability of a good outcome and this of a bad one. And you know, I don't think people are actually calculating probabilities here, but this is a pretty good caricature the way people think. Will I be better off here in expectation than here? The strategies for dealing with a problem of this kind fall in two large categories. One of them is sometimes you can attach, you can affirmatively attach consequences to these outcomes, punishments and rewards. The second thing you can do is to change people's view of the facts of the situation, and that's expressed in the probabilities of the different outcomes. So these are kind of knowledge-based, and these are power-based approaches. Um, now, what's special about uh, What's special about the kind of um, siting disputes we're likely to face with a train is that a train is a train. For the typical NIMBY project, typical NIMBY project, we see a characteristic donut pattern. And this might apply to uh, neighbors of a proposed uh, station. Right on the site, right on the site there, right on the site there are people. This is very directional. Uh, there are people whose property will be taken. And if the project goes forward, the outcome they expect is an outcome they'll experience someplace else, possibly far away. But they're going to be paid. Right? At least whatever it is, the, the, the land will be paid and so on. Then surrounding this, there's a ring where people can face maybe tax benefits, but these are public projects. It's probably not going to help very much. Increase in property values. If you have any property, if you're a renter, that doesn't look so good. Uh, there might be better jobs, but they might not be a better job for you. And then in a larger circle, uh, there are people who are concerned about reputation and property values. The, the NIMBY dimensions of siting stations, I think, are not a big deal for a rail project. On the whole, the local benefits, as we've heard, they're uncertain. It's not clear who gets them. But on the whole, the local benefits of being near a station where people are getting on and off the train are probably mostly positive. And they're certainly not the kind of thing that get people in the streets protesting the hazardous waste uh, landfill. Um, what I'm concerned about is their right of way. And here you have this pattern where there's a band. There's going to be some taking in a very narrow stripe. And that's going to be settled as it is. 
But then there are a whole bunch of people, and we heard something about this yesterday, there are a bunch of people who are abutters and landowners um, who are going to have trouble getting across the tracks. These aren't grade crossings. For, we're talking about high-speed rail, not grade crossings. How much are we going to spend on bridges and tunnels? And um, the train's going to be going by. And the more successful this project is, the more frequent the trains will go by. <clears throat> How many, people, how many people here have ridden in a uh, high-speed train? Almost everybody. Um, how many people have been, been within, a, say, 100 meters of one of these going by at full speed? Somewhat fewer, significantly fewer. So this is significant, that most people's experience of this has been, has been the positive experience of sitting in a really comfortable vehicle doing work on your laptop, looking out the window at the French countryside going by. Um, I, however, have spent a fair amount of time vacationing in France on a bicycle, and a couple of times the, the route went across the high-speed rail, and here came the train. It's 105 decibel experience from um, 100 feet away, and if you move out to a football field away, it's still an 80 decibel experience. And because it's a line source rather than a point source, it doesn't go down with the square of the distance, it goes down linearly. And it's extremely intrusive to have one of these things go by. I mean, it's not like a mile-long train full of coal cars, but people have already accommodated to that. And that's going to be important. It's going to, I don't think it's going to be all that important in the rural areas of the Central Valley because there aren't that many people who live there, uh, and they tend not to be uh, rich. But I'm... I don't know, if you go away here with one idea, I want you to think about the, uh, I want you to think about the part of the right away from San Francisco to beyond San Jose, and who lives along that path, and are we really going to put it underground? Um, so, again, I, um, I sort of mentioned a couple of these. Risks are modest. This is about nuisance. It's not like uh, many of the kind of NIMBYs that we've learned how to manage these. But if we do, and especially, um, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be most important in dealing with people who have plenty of capacity to reach into the political system and direct it. Um, where the train is going by, not just through their garden, but behind it. Um, is it possible to reframe this from an injustice and an oppression to an opportunity? And here I want to tell a parable that many of you may find unconvincing, but it works for me. Think of somebody driving through the woods in, um, in the winter in northern New England, um, and it's winter and cold, and he opens the window of his car to throw out an apple core, uh, this is a good person, uh, biodegradable trash, and here's a cry for help, and stops the car and listens, and it turns out a child has fallen through the ice of a pond right next to the road. And without thinking about it, he climbs out of his car, splashes into the pond, and saves the child. Now I want you to imagine the scene where there's emergency vehicles and flashing red lights, and a reporter comes and sticks a microphone in this person's face. How do you feel? You saved this child. He's sitting shivering under a blanket. It's freezing cold. He says, I am furious. The injustice here is too much to bear. I, I'm going to catch a cold. I'm late for dinner. It's inexcusable. And I'm going to sue everybody. Most people think that conversation is unimaginable, that nobody would react that way, would say, I'm so grateful that I happened to be there and opened my window. It's just, right, I'm benefited by the chance to bear a reasonable risk, it wasn't no risk, I'm cold, I could have drowned, but I didn't, chance to bear a reasonable risk for the community benefit. Well, finding a place to put one of these facilities that has to be somewhere and can't be everywhere could be reframed in this way with the right political leadership. And here I want to be pessimistic and refer you to the um, analysis of the California political, uh, uh, the, the political structure that we've um, dug ourselves into in California in last week's Economist. I'm not sure that the machinery we have to make decisions like this in California is up to a challenge of this kind. 
not just the NIMBY disputes, but also the funding, the um, oath that I didn't, I thought this was a myth, but it turns out to be true that Republicans in the legislature are specifically instructed that if they ever vote for a tax, because they're a permanent minority, they ever vote for a tax, they will be primaried in the next election. Otherwise, they can vote their conscience, gay marriage, it's okay, no problem, whatever you want to vote for, vote for any tax, that's our rule. This is going to be kind of a problem in proceeding with projects on a scale of this kind, and I'm not sure actually that we have the machinery to deal with it. All right, what can we expect? Um, we can expect uh, opponents to portray NIMBYs as nopes, and there is a legitimate case to be made. I don't think it's persuasive, but it's not a crazy thing to say that this is just not a good thing to build at all. So there are going to be alliances of people who don't want it here with the people who don't want it at all. Expect the advocates of projects to tend to browbeat the process with technical arguments and not to be good at engaging with real local concerns. Because let's remember, the costs, the costs to NIMBY neighbors are real costs. That doesn't mean that everything that's claimed to be a cost is real, but there are real costs. It's really noisy. It really does get in the way of traffic. Um, and let's expect that the benefit-cost analysis is going to undervalue the quality of life dimensions of projects like this. So there's a built-in, we look at GDP, we look at things traded in markets to see it, we look at how much it costs in things you buy with money to, to do the benefit-cost analysis. Um, if we have time, I'd like to come back later and talk a little bit about this being one piece, right, this kind of inner-city transportation being one piece of an addiction to automobiles that has costs that are much bigger than climate and why they're so important, and it won't solve it by itself. But that's not going to be, I believe that's not going to be as important a part of the discussion as it should be for a project of this kind that, as we've heard, is only one piece of, uh, of dealing with the larger transportation issue. And, and now, uh, Lisa Schweitzer. Hello, everybody. Oh, oh thank you. Appreciate it, though. Let me get this started. Um, I'm going to start out today with a little bit of a disclaimer uh, to help you understand where I'm coming from. I am not part of the choir. In fairness to all of you, I have been a skeptic for most of my career on this, and, but I'm a friendly skeptic. Not unlike Fox Mulder, um, I want to believe. Um, but there are a number of facets of the proposals that have gone forward that have disturbed me greatly. Um, and that I, I'd like to be able to take some time today to talk about some of the particular things that have left me much, more, much less supportive than I would be otherwise. And that as a friendly skeptic, uh, in, in going forward with the new plans and new proposals, you might be able to help me defect, right? Because I'm absolutely sold on the vision. It's the implementation where I'm, is where I'm having trouble. So with that, and, and this basically comes from uh, you know, watching the politics unfold and looking at the political economy and the larger narrative about what's happening with high-speed rail, the federal level, and being very dissatisfied with the caricatures of how opponents to the project have been portrayed, particularly in The Economist, more recently in some op-eds for CNN, which sort of portray people who are questioning the project sort of as just, you know, oh, it's those rural senators, they're parochial, they just don't get it, they've never traveled on all these wonderful systems, why can't these people just figure out that this is a great thing? And um, maybe so, there's some truth to that, um, but um, my mother, who is a lifelong Democrat, absolutely positively 100% on Team Obama, she thinks Governor Brown is just the greatest thing since sliced bread. She's the daughter of European socialists who had to flee Germany because they were political enemies of, of the Nazis. Um, her liberal credentials, I would argue, are as good of, as anybody's. She didn't graduate from high school, and so one day, last fall, when we were having these discussions, she asked me on a telephone call, how come we can afford high-speed rail but we can't afford schools? And my answer to that was, <laughs> which is not really a particularly good answer from somebody who has a fancy dancy PhD and tenure in a policy school. <laughs> and it got me to thinking about the whole idea of how counterfactuals are constructed in our analyses of high-speed rail and in the public mind about what are we giving up when we're trading these things. And arguably, I think the lesson from the federal buzzsaw uh, that uh, 
Barack Obama unfortunately ended up walking into around this is that the, the capital costs associated with this are by far the biggest barrier to implementation and that if we have a plan that tells us a little bit more than we have now about where the funding is coming from and how we're going to support it and how we're going to insulate the general taxpayers and other budgetary programs from the potential cost increases that could feasibly occur, um, I think you'd probably get a lot more people like me and my mom on board. And I'm sorry, that was a real pun, but it was unintended. In some respects, what I want, right, isn't really the issue, and what's confusing my mom isn't really the issue, because it's very clear that people in the state of California do want this. Um, Proposition 1A passed, and it wasn't a huge margin. This is, I wouldn't call this a mandate from the people. Um, but just as a little bit of more disclosure and get you thinking about this sort of capital cost questions, I was one of the people who voted no on this, and I would have voted yes if these had been infrastructure bonds instead of general obligation bonds, right? Because of the sense of moving infrastructure payments and infrastructure funding into the general obligation and into the general tax base. And that gets to my mom's question about the counterfactual. Infrastructure in the United States has been, for the most part, a pay-as-you-go. It's not a user-based system per se. It's not tit-for-tat. It's not 100% user charge-based. But we do have the capacity to raise revenues with infrastructure projects, and high-speed rail is one of those that has tremendous potential for raising revenues through ticket sales and ticket taxes and operate much the same way, with some cross-subsidies in the system, much the same way that airlines do. And so the question that my mom asked about, well, why do we have to ask general taxpayers for money for this system if it's going to be so great, um, if you know, people can pay for themselves, and that, I think, leads to a broad-based perspective that this is a direct transfer from the general taxpayer, and in particular, people who are dependent on social programs that may be getting crowded out of the federal budget, I'll look at that in a second, into the hands of business travelers, construction companies, and the communities that are directly benefiting from the project. And there's no doubt that this has tremendous benefits, but that we are in a distributive game here, and that the distributive game can play out at multiple levels, just as Professor O'Hare just pointed out at the local level. It also takes place at the state and the federal level. How did we get to the point where I really started to worry about this? Well, the federal gas tax has been 18 cents a gallon and has not increased since 1993. Um, I've talked about the pay-as-you-go finance, and we, we did okay kind of keeping ourselves at the red, in the, in, in the black at the federal level, until 2009 when we finally hit a point with the Highway Trust Fund, which I think we should just rename the Transport Trust Fund and be done with it, right? Just stop arguing about the name. Quit pretending that it's all for highways or that it should all be for highways. But there was an $8 billion shortfall in the fund at that point. And when sort of we got to this point and there was wide wage reporting on this, a commission from the National Academy of Sciences said to the Obama administration, what we really need to do is, since we haven't had a gas increase for close to 17 years, we should probably increase it marginally by a dime and then start looking at use-based fees to reinvigorate the fund. And the response was, mm, no, we're not doing that. At the same time, our president has really committed to infrastructure spending across the board. This is a tree map from the New York Times. It's a really great visualization for how the budgets are set up, and you should take a look at it. But we should look here at transportation, this little square here, is that even though um, one of our major funds, it's not the only fund that drives the, the transport spending here by any stretch of the imagination, but even though we started out $9 billion in the hole in 2009, and we're still there, um, this is green. So the green in the map shows that it's getting a nice boost or it's getting an increase or a budgetary increase. So where is that money coming from? And in particular, we should look at this one, and this is where the federal high-speed rail commitment came from. This was the $8 billion that President Obama suggested to go into FRA. So who lost? You know, we did reduce, the budget did propose to reduce military spending by some, but we had an EPA cut by over a billion. We had weatherization programs cut from the um, Aid Administration for Children and Families, um, Energy Assistant. Uh, they lost about 7% of its budget, about, seven bill about 1 billion. Internal Revenue Service lost about 25%, which the part of me that just paid a lot of taxes is like, yeah. Um, the part of me that knows how this works is that the less they're able to surveil, the more leakage there is in the system and the more we're, we're less capable of recouping the revenues that we need to make the ship run. And then the Office of Federal Student Aid lost 11% of its budget, um, which 
is a program that's directly focused on low-income people. Um, veteran, veterans benefits programs were cut. A lot of these programs are essentially for low-income people, and at the same time, we're taking this money from the discretionary funds of the general revenues and moving them into infrastructure finance. Um, right. Um, the pushback from the Republican side was no taxes. Forget about it. Everybody agrees we're not having any new taxes. We're going to get the transport system off the general fund dole. System users should pay their own way. We should privatize the system to bring in new money rather than taxes. But then if we accept that line of thinking, then we know we're going to have user fees and probably market-based fares for the system that we're proposing. And so the questions that I want to leave you with today are this, this idea of who is right. Right, we've got these very large capital costs associated with building this new system, which I agree will be fantastic when it's done. But who's right about who should pay for it up front and how we should build in the guarantees to sort of protect programs that we're interested in protecting from infrastructure creep into the general fund? Is it more fair to have users pay their own way? Is it more fair to fund transportation from general revenues? or as we do across the world, use petrol taxes and vehicle fees to supplement general funds. To just get us to a point where we say, okay, you know, the service isn't gonna be running for a good long time yet, so we can't use fares now, but we can use gas tax or a dedicated increase in the gas tax by a penny, three pennies, whatever it takes. Put that into a special fund. It keeps this off the table in terms of general revenues, keeps it out of other programs' budgets, and provides a way of planning for um, clawbacks once we do get the system running. So, you know, the government says, we'll subsidize you up to 30%, 50%, 60%, whatever we find agreeable, through fuel tax revenues from everywhere, and then you pay that back when the system is up and running. That's the sort of thing that would get me to sort of stop laying awake nights going, how are we gonna pay for this thing? And who pays for it, and who goes without because we've decided to spend the money on infrastructure instead of the other counterfactuals that we could construct. Um, with that, I'll hand over the mic. They're very helpful to hear from a friendly skeptic. Okay, Julian. Uh, hi, everyone. So um, maybe I will be following up maybe on uh, Professor O'Hara's um, presentation and maybe give a few examples of um, problems and issue or issues we may have had in France uh, while designing high speed, uh, the high-speed rail network and how we gradually, in the last 30 years, uh, improved the process of designing the lines in order to um, um, reduce the, the, the problems with the, the, the neighbors uh, of the infrastructure would have or to uh, try to solve the, some of the NIMBY issues. So, uh, as you know, now I know the, Fran the French net high-speed rail network is now encompasses like uh, 1,200 miles. It was built in several steps. Uh, and so those are the first, uh, I would say, four steps, the first four lines. And for those lines, the process of uh, designing and building them was pretty straightforward. So SNCF would do, basically do all the design, the, all the engineering. And when everything would be decided, they would like, present that to the public, to general public. There would be a so-called public, public survey to get the, the, the comments of the public, and then we would move forward without maybe taking too much account of what was said, or uh, just the minimum. But then in 2001, the high-speed line number five, with this, the fifth, uh, line was built, and it suddenly changed because there, there was a very strong uh, public opposition. And uh, the project basically was totally blocked by uh, local and NIMBY issues. Those are the last uh, steps. So uh, as I said, the first li four lines were S S SNCF was alone in charge of the project, and there was this image that the project was built by engineers in Paris that wouldn't know too much about uh, what was happening on the, on the field. And the public consultation only happened once the design was totally completed. High-speed uh, high line five 
was uh, the, the public the process was to be exactly the same and the public consultation the public survey to happen in 1990 but then things didn't go well so these are my artistic skills i hope you can uh, read I just i wanted to to show how why this is different uh, high speed line one to four were designed in on mostly flat agricultural land or in uh, in hills that were mo that were mostly forest and desert uh, and whole sections were built in the same right of way as the freeways. So there was very low, uh, not, not too many people that get uh, upset by the line because there were simply not too many people there. High speed line five is totally different. As we saw before, this is the, the Rhone Valley between Lyon and Marseille. This is obviously a very populated area. So here you can see in a mile of, uh, in a range of 30 miles between uh, the mountains, basically, you have uh, two train lines, you have one major freeway, actually the busiest in France, you have usually cities, you have the big river, and you have the vi vineyards like the Côte du Rhône that you maybe know. That was a very uh, densely, densely populated uh, area and very high land value. Um, so that was the first problem. And second also in the 80s, what happened in the 80s, and I think it started to happen earlier in the United States, but uh, there was a big decrease in the, in the, tr in the trust of general public in, uh, in the expertise of like, the experts. And what, I, what played a role in France was uh, what happened in the nuclear industry because almost in the same time you had uh, in the, uh, the Chernobyl uh, explosion in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, it was the Soviet Union by that time, and you had an opening of a new generation of nuclear plant in France with very little uh, public uh, consultation and a very strong uh, public opposition. So that obviously played a role. The fact that these two elements were so close to each other, it helped to uh, raise the distrust against uh, the experts a lot. So in 1990, this project was um, uh, just, hap just came to public consultation. So in 1989, the government asked SNCF to design the line, and at the end of the line, at the end of the year, SNCF uh, disclosed a, lay a layout, very precise and narrow layout uh, on the whole 200 miles uh, section. And there were a lot of demonstration. Uh, the project uh, um, from the winter through all the spring, a lot of demonstration in the, in the region, Basically, in the beginning, it was like NIMBY people. Uh, and the opposition was really, the, there was no, uh, the pr people were still accepting the idea of the project, just not here. So uh, SNCF first reacted uh, alone and uh, was still in charge of the project. So uh, a local project manager was appointed so that was the first time that actually the project was not handled from Paris, but from actually Aix-en-Provence. Uh, and they studied other options. And in total, they studied like 2,000 2, miles of option. The result was that instead of having uh, people uh, angry around these two, 200 miles of, uh, of these 200 miles of, uh, of layout, actually there were 10 times more people that were angry because everyone thought that actually this option will, is the one that is going to be built. And then they, they had more reasons to, to, um, to complain. But the SNCF didn't make final recommendation. They said this is up to the, uh, the state or, log or public authorities to make these decisions. And actually, uh, even the, the pr President uh, Mitterrand got involved. Actually, he had very good local connections. And he, re he rejected, uh, basically, he rejected the, the first proposal of SNCF. So that didn't help. So there were major crisis and actually in August, people in three times, three different cities, they just blocked all trail traffic for a few days and uh, to, to really protest. So that, was, that had never been seen before. So then we moved to an, a new step because obviously SNCF wouldn't be able to handle that and obviously SNCF wasn't perceived as being neutral in this debate. So the state came in charge and an, um, an ombudsman was appointed it was a civil servant that had absolutely no expertise in rail, and that was an important point. And he took all what SNCF, all the layout that SNCF studied, 
and it discussed basically with all associations, and there were a lot uh, there. And like a few months later, it disclosed a pre what, what was a preferred option. Uh, so it wasn't a definitive choice, but it, it was his opinion of somebody that was totally external to the project who said uh, uh, what his view was of what was uh, better, what would be best for the, the project. Still, there were demonstration and more um, and more people getting angry. But what was interesting is at that time, it was less and less NIMBYism and more and more people discussion about what is this project really useful? Do we need this line? So there was a shift, and I think that's something that has been seen in many other projects. That in the beginning, uh, it's very important that the people, the NIMBY people, start to speak not about their own interest but about kind of general or at least regional interest. So what happened? There was a fourth stage, fourth and final stage, and then a college of a so-called college of experts was appointed. So half of the experts were appointed by either the government uh, or SNCF. The other half was appointed by the opposing associations. So they had to work together, and they went and reviewed all the studies that had been done so far, and to check, and they even commissioned a foreign uh, experts from UK, for instance, there was a major engineering firm that came from UK to review all the studies. And uh, so, as the opponents were involved on board, the first conclusion came, and the, the first conclusion was yes, this project is needed because within 10 years, the whole region, the congestion will grow so much that we need something. So, from this point, actually, since the criticism had moved from NIMBYism to is this project useful? And since the conclusion was yes, then the position basically like collapsed or almost disappeared. And the, pub the, 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 the project could go on and uh, the public survey could happen in 1992, from 1992 to 1994. And all the process was uh, so uh, completed like four years later. So, the project ultimately got built, and the train started to operate in 2001. Um, so what, were, what was key in the, in the success, there were two major things uh, that, were, that were key, like in many other projects, actually. The compensation system and the governance side. But what was new there is that for the first time um, in the rail sector, uh, all these things were kind of formalized, but discovered, they discovered on, when, while they were trying to move. So what on the compensation side, what they did basically is there were legal requirements that were quite low. Actually, they said, OK, now we are got just going to broaden the range of people who can get compensated. And there was a system where everyone could actually sell its property or its house for a pre-agreed price up to three years after project commissioning. And uh, also, there were a lot of direct negotiations. And it was important that uh, an independent body filed all the results of the negotiations, all the commitments of the state, and this commission would review year after year what, what, uh, what commitments were uh, implemented or not. And there were more than 400 co of those commitments. And as of now, I think more than 400, out of these 464, something like 420 or 430 have been uh, actually implemented. And the third innovation was that uh, landscape designer and architect got involved very early in the project, uh, and they made like my, what ha, what ha, appears to be minor changes to the project, but that had that had a great uh, that were great meaning for the local uh, uh, for the neighbors, and that helped the design that together, uh, actually. So the the neighbors got in some way involved in the, in, in the design. Two things were learned on the governance side. First is that uh, ever since then, uh, government has been very, uh, and central government have been uh, very involved in the project because uh, uh, they helped make the decision and when SNCF was alone doing that, they couldn't be perceived as neutral. They were not obviously neutral. They wanted to do this project. It was their job, they were paid for that. So everyone was just questioning, and it was normal. They were questioning their expertise. So the central government played a central role. But who, the ex independent experts still played a more important role, because the state even was not perceived as um, neutral. 
And that was the first time in an infrastructure project this independent experts got such an important uh, place to question systematically uh, SNCF's assertions. That was important. So the conclusion of uh, this project was that new legal requirements were created, and especially we now have a national commission of public debate, so-called, that has to be, uh, uh, that has to organize for uh, every mega infrastructure mega project that's over uh, 400 million dollars, or euros, sorry, uh, to, no dollars, actually, to, organize, to set up such a public debate at the very early stage of the project. So remember, before we had like, SNCF would do all the study, then go to public survey, like the, only the three last boxes of the, of the chart here. And now we added like these two additional uh, boxes at the very beginning, and that changes, that has changed many things. For instance, the high speed rail projects after uh, this one have all gone through this process. And I would say things have happened more smoothly. I wouldn't say there is no problem at all, but that happens more smoothly. I want to give another example. That's not a high speed rail project. Okay. That's the CDG Express, that's the Ex Airport Express project in, uh, in, in Paris. So there was an initial project actually made by SNCF. In, this is the orange line. So they wanted to, ex, uh, that was 25 ki ki kilometer link, including a big new tunnel to go straight from Paris to the airport. And there was this existing blue line here that, that's, that was used both by commuters and by people that would go to the airport. And the commuters, they would complain because the punctuality and the quality of service on this line is very bad. And they would say, but we gain nothing from this like orange project. And there was this national debate, that this public debate that was organized. And those people came, complained, and they brought their own experts. And these experts, they questioned the project and they showed that actually they could do another project that was actually this, about the same price, but that could benefit also both the commuters and the people going to the airport. So they came up with a new project, that's the green project here on the map, and actually that's the project that is going ultimately to be implemented. So the public debate resulted in a complete change of the project. And I think most of the people now would agree that that was for the best of the project because for the same price, we could actually improve the service also for the commuters. Um, yeah, and just another thing I just wanted to add, 30 seconds. Uh, now with something new has been set up like only two years ago, is for People re of complain because on your high speed line, from, for, for instance, between Paris and Lyon, Paris and Lyon would be obviously benefit from the high speed line, but in the people in the middle wouldn't benefit too much. There is a strong tunnel effect. So we have set, set up a new system where the pro project owner would pay a, to a regional solidarity fund, so-called. Uh, so that's 0.4% of the cost, total cost of the project, and that money that fund is dedicated to this, to the economic development uh, or additional uh, environmental mitigation measures in the, the so-called like tunnel regions, in the regions in the middle. So in order to have a kind of redistribution uh, effect. And that also, I think, contributes to uh, enhance the social acceptance of the, of the lines. So all is not beautiful and easy in France, but I think in the time we have learned and now we, are, uh, we have new tools that help a lot uh, uh, design the project and make them enhance their acceptance. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And um, our final panelist before going to questions and, and uh, from you guys is Mike Burnick. Um, Gabriel, I'm gonna be very brief, much briefer. Um, actually, I want to say, though, um, Bob Severo, who called me about this panel, um, and I did some work for the authority back in 1995. We went to France to study uh, high-speed rail and land use around the stations and uh, did some work. And um, I can't say I've been as, I see our friend Jim Haas out here. I haven't been in as many conferences in the past 16 years as Jim has, but I have <laughs> kept in touch. But it's good to see a lot of our old friends. Um, and especially Jim. Um, I want to talk very briefly about um, a relatively more narrow issue than the others. It's a study I've just been involved in over the past year um, in the Central Valley. 
and it's a study that tries to look at the job impacts in the Central Valley. And um, let me. Uh, um, it was a study commissioned by the um, Workforce Investment Boards of the Central Valley. Is, is, is everyone familiar with the WIBs or Workforce Investments? Um, the WIBs are the, the bodies, the public bodies in each of the counties, basically, um, that control the federal money, uh, job training money that comes in. And especially under ERA, there was more job training money in California than I've seen in 30 years. There is basically had a lot of job training money and very few jobs. But they asked the question, what would be the job impacts for our residents um, in the Valley? And um, I was part of this team um, that um, was headed by ADE, an excellent um, um, economics firm based in Walnut Creek. And the general, the over, overall study was to look at all of the infrastructure projects and a um, number of very interesting things. Um, this, was the, this was our um, uh, target area. It was the California, Central California Workforce Collaborative. Um, basically, the, the uh, 11 WIBs, Workforce Investment Boards, within that area. And um, first, we looked at Central Valley employment and unemployment. Very quickly, very interesting in the Central Valley. You know, you constantly hear, um, if you look at the most recent EDD figures, um, unemployment in Fresno is over 18%. In virtually all of the Central Valley uh, counties, it's double digits. Um, it's misleading. This double digit employment, I um, was the head of our labor department, state labor department, EDD, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Well, we had unemployment in the state, if you recall, running um, in many of our counties. Um, not only the Bay Area counties, but in Orange County and um, in San Diego County, over, under 4%. In fact, um, there was a real question whether we had the Phillips curve, that we had both low inflation and low unemployment. But um, even then, the Central Valley was running double-digit unemployment. And it's just the nature of that economy, highly agricultural-based, seasonally-based, um, and... Um, in good times and more recently. Uh, more recently, it's gone up slightly. As I say, it's up to 18% um, in Fresno. But um, even in good times, it's running double digits. Anyway, here's a quick look at the 14-county region, uh, the total labor force. You see a significant labor force, 1.8 million um, in the region, quickly. Um, the construction labor force, was, which was partic a particular focus, you can see, is is significant, it's uh, 107,000, um, slightly under 10% of the labor force. Um, this is, these are 2009 figures, um, and um, breakdown by the, by the various counties. What's very interesting here, you look at construction employment in California, people often think construction employment is infrastructure. In fact, infrastructure is a tiny part of our uh, construction employment. If we look at these figures, um, and just the Central Valley, but it's true throughout the state, the bulk of construction employment um, is in two areas. One is in residential and commercial construction, and the other area, which is even bigger, are what are known as specialty trade contractors. These are the people who come to your house and you know fix your roof or fix your plumbing or do. Uh, but it's very interesting. Infrastructure actually is is less than 14 percent. Um, heavy and civil engineering of the construction workforce. Um, and it's also a workforce in the Central Valley um, that um, mainly is full-time, but has a lot of, given the nature of construction work, part-time work. Um, so we're dealing with a labor force in the Central Valley that's significant, 1.8 million, construction labor force about 107,000, um, mostly full-time, but, but a significant part-time component. So what did we find out in terms of the job impacts? Um, well, one, if you look at the, this was the infrastructure that is, um, has a good chance of being funded. Some of it, especially the Delta conveyance, is more problematic. But um, 36 billion over this 10-year period. What it suggests is that for the Central Valley, even though the private sector has struggled along, um, even struggles in good times, but particularly has struggled over the past, um, since 2007, 
um, there's a very vibrant public sector economy going there in terms of infrastructure, of which high-speed rail is a main piece, though not the only piece. Um, and this chart, and by the way, anyone who wants this, I'm glad to, anyone by some chance is interested, I'm glad to email the PowerPoint. Uh, this is a breakdown of the various funding sources on the federal, state, um, regional, and local level. You'll see actually a, a good part of the funding sources are the state level. Um, here's another uh, breakdown in terms of um, cost. I want to come back to that. Um, we then, um, ADE then used an implant model, uh, input-output model, um, to ask how do these jobs going to break down um, in terms of cost. The, the um, High-Speed Rail Authority has done some work on that, good work in the past. This was an attempt to use the implant model and go a little bit deeper um, for all, first of all, for all public sector projects and then for high-speed rail. Uh, this is the overview of all projects. Um, these are in job years. There's an attempt to try to make it a more honest assessment by using job years so that somebody who wasn't employed for one day was counted the same as, it was a, some of the same issues we had with ERA, but um, this was an honest attempt to look at job years. Um, so what did we find out? on what we're most interested in high-speed rail. Well, this is a breakdown. We took the, these figures reflect, and it's a constantly changing reality in terms of funding. These figures were based on the 5.5 billion um, that was the budget utilized um, at the end of last year and early this year, plus 500 million for the maintenance facility. So 6 billion in spending, um, 5.5 associated with the line and segment, 500,000 for the maintenance facility. So what do we see here? Well, one, we see that the majority of jobs are likely to be in construction, uh, 17,895. But there still is a significant number of jobs in terms of professional services. Um, we often think of infrastructure projects in terms of construction jobs. In fact, they generate a significant number of you know, professional services broken down in some detail here this is the range of services in, from the pre-construction, environmental, engineering, design, um, like HNTV, and um, the construction management, some of the public outreach, a variety of jobs. But not the majority of jobs. By far, the majority are going to be in construction, but still a significant number of jobs. Um, and um, we then did a projection over a 10-year period. So what can we say of all of this in terms of jobs? Well, one, we see that in terms of direct job creation, this is very limited compared to the labor force in the Central Valley and unemployment in the Central Valley. By itself, it doesn't have a dramatic impact. I've always argued um, that the main impact of the Central Valley, uh, the main impact of high-speed rail, and I'm glad we have a healthy spec skeptic, um, but the main impact is going to be um, the non-direct jobs, the other impacts in terms of linking the Central Valley to the rest of the state economy. And the other impacts I'm sure we've talked about in great, great detail um, yesterday. Um, but we also see some direct, some significant direct impact in terms of jobs. So what does that mean in terms of job train? Because that's really what the WIBs do. So they were asking the question, what? Well, um, uh, criticism often made of job training, by the way, in California, is that we train for jobs that don't exist. In my experience in this, in 32 years, that isn't the case at all, and especially it isn't true now. Most of these workforce investment boards are highly, highly geared to what jobs are opening up uh, in their particular geographic area. And in fact, they have very good real time. They and the staffing companies have the best, if you want to find out what's going on in the job market, the WIBs and the staffing companies are best. But in any event, I think what's key, what you see here um, is that um, there's a real rich variety of job training programs that already exist in the state and already exist in the Valley and a lot going on. So it's all to say I, I've encouraged them. I think they're going to start a push now to work with our friends at the authority um, to um, focus on specific jobs opening up and uh, specific training programs. I think the key is working the workforce investment boards tying very early in the process, even in this design build process, it's highly 
uh, private sector oriented, tied to the authority. But I, they're, they're moving on that. It's not a, a big job generator directly in terms of solving the Central Valleys, but it's a significant one, and if properly targeted, um, can have the right impact. And with that, Gabriel, I think I finished early. Thank you very much, Mike. So please send cards up. Um, we may not get to all of them, but I'll do my best. Um, I may merge questions if they're sort of similar or related. Um, to start out with, um, uh, Professor O'Hare, um, given your, your kind of um, power structure analysis of, of the, those, the, the problems of collective action, what strategic advice would you give to proponents of high-speed rail? I think I have a slide for that. <laughs> yeah, can I have my slides back? Is anybody in a position? Okay, there. Um. Okay, so these are, this is a list of the key factors that turn out to be important in a public, in a public recognition of a process like this being legitimate. And the, and the perception of the process being legitimate is really central here. Um, the, most important th the most important thing I'd, rec I'd recommend, of course, is to play it straight. Uh, use the best... Uh, um, Use the best science. Don't uh, don't kite estimates of benefits. Um, make sure that uh, make sure that uh, all of your predictions and analysis hold water. Um, and I think what's going to be necessary is that the proponents get leadership from pretty high up in the state political structure. I don't know if that's really good advice because I don't know if it's possible to pull it off. I'm, I, I've really become quite pessimistic about the possibility that this can can actually happen in California for a number of reasons. Or that, there's, or that there's a few enough players who can make a difference in the process to make it happen. Um, it's gonna take too long, for one thing. We're, this is a project that's gonna unfold with all the predictable delays, given how long it's taking for us to fix our bridge. It's gonna unfold over a decade through two gubernatorial terms and an entire replacement of the state legislature. Um, I'm not sure that it has the inertia to keep going once we start laying some track and, and other things become interesting um, uh, and possibly other things become more important. But this is, this is basically the list. Um, it's got to not be coercive, okay? It's got to recognize that there's an underlying mistrust of government, a mistrust of the private sector, and a mistrust of science that pervades social decision making now, especially in California. You can see it in the newspaper in every page. Um, people don't want to be taken advantage of. Um, and uh, if the process looks, if the process seems to have been unfair, and the story we've heard from France bears directly on that, that the process has to be and seem to be a legitimate representation of public attitudes. Has to be and seem to be. So a lot of attention's got to be put to how people understand it really unfolding. Um, so avoid all these mistakes and the odds improve. But I, I think it's, you know, I, I don't want to promise that this is going to solve the problem. Um, look, I, again, I was talking about, I'm concerned about the right of way through the, through the, um, through the uh, peninsula south of San Francisco. The top 5%, the top 5% of American income earners have taken all of the increase in GDP since 1990 or as near as makes no difference. That's who lives there. This is not a population, this is not a population recently characterized by an obligation to the common wheel that one might direct and bring to bear to a project of this kind when it's going through their gardens. It's gonna require aggressive affirmative leadership of a type that I'm not sure the California political structure can deliver. Sorry. Okay. Um, I've got a lot of questions relating to this segment of uh, between San Jose and San Francisco. 
you know, we, the High Speed Rail Authority, by most of our estimates, made the right decision to try to locate the alignment through existing communities rather than, you know, bypasses and cheaper land. Um, so the system has the potential to reinforce center-oriented growth patterns rather than sprawl, right? But the consequence of that is threading it through these already developed areas, both in Southern California and in the Bay Area. It's very tricky. So I have questions, including from what appears to be a skeptic about how um, uh, uh, the tracks will divide the communities. I have other questions who say, given the apparent desire of the uh, wealthy residents in the peninsula to not have high-speed rail, should the Altamont alignment be reopened? Um, so, and, and then I suppose a, a series of questions that ask the question, is it too late to rethink the alignment? I don't know, I'm looking at Greg Albright, who is not a, not a panelist, but um, is somebody who I think might be better able to speak to this question of, is it too late to reopen the alignment or not? Can I have a comment? Yeah, please. No comment. Oh, no comment? I thought you said, can I have a comment? Um, uh, Greg, do you want to do you want to say anything? I mean, should we be re reopening the question of the alignment or not, uh -huh. given what you, given what we've heard today? This is a hard position for me to be in because I can't speak for the board, of course. Uh, Greg Albright, and I'm uh, pro program management um, on the program management team. And um, I'm going to suggest, I'm going to skirt around the question and not answer it because it really boils down to uh, decisions have been made and now, they're, now we're facing a, a, some really tough political issues. The uh, High Speed Rail Board will be meeting on Thursday and I think there'll be an executive report that'll speak to some of the issues on the PINSA and uh, some of the potential ways of working towards a solution that can uh, address uh, multiple outcomes. So, you, you did a good job putting me on the spot, and I did and a good job. And you did a good job getting out of it. That's okay. right. <laughs> because um, uh, I, I do want to hold my job for a little longer. Okay. Uh, uh, Lisa, do you want to speak to this question? Is it too late to reopen the alignment question or not? Do you need to push this? No. Okay. Um, this, is a, this is a really big question from the financial side, too, because the risks of not getting it into the major population centers in California mean that the financial universe that I'm worried about get much, much murkier, right? If it's a choice of not getting into San Francisco at all versus getting to Transbay, that's a big, that's a big financial consequence in terms of the number of riders that we could expect and the, and the financial consequences for their fares. So it's, it's a question that I think we should worry about, even if we're not really in a position of being able to reopen the alignment. You know, I, I will just answer this question with an observation that the, um, the Southern Pacific Line was supposed to be extended into downtown San Francisco. Jim Haas, what year was that? Originally 19... 1911 and 1915. There's a building at the foot of Market Street, for those of you who know San Francisco, that was designed to be the terminus. And it never got there because they, um, they decided that, it, you know, well, a lot of reasons. So who knows, right? We don't know. It's very risky to, to end up um, deciding that you don't have it quite good enough and want to go rethink the alignment. You certainly sign up for decade plus delay before you see anything at best. Okay. Um, a question, um, several questions about um, distributing compensation payments. Um, is 0.4% to the people in the tunnel area fair? Um, is there a precedent for, for directly compensating property owners whose property values will be decreased sort of in proportion to proximity to the rail? Um, what's the best way to look at that? Um, we already can't afford the system if we're buying out the Atherton property owners for their impacts. What does that do to the, to the um, price of the project? Um, anybody who wants to speak to that? Whether, whether we pay people for the cost we impose has nothing to do with the cost of the project. Okay? Who pays the cost of having a train run by and decreasing their property value? doesn't mean that the property value didn't decrease in value and that value wasn't destroyed. Let's be clear about this. Mm -hmm. It makes it manifest, but it doesn't have anything to do with whether society can afford this project, that you can 
take resources from some people without giving them. I think that's a no-brainer. I think it's, it's the beginning of legitimacy for a project of this kind that the people who are injured by it are going to be made whole because there are large surpluses. If it's worth building at all, there are large surpluses um, available to be distributed in this way. It does, that doesn't mean you can go ahead merely by paying people off, but I don't see really how you can start politically if you're not doing that. And it's expensive. You got to lean into the microphone. Um, there is precedent. We do pay. Uh, we have paid uh, compensation to people nearby uh, airports, so it's been done before. Um, okay. So Greg, add that to the budget. Um, <laughs> another question: um, What is the right? Uh, how, how should we interpret the rejection of federal high-speed rail funds um, from F Florida and other states? I mean, what's the right way to think about that? Who wants to take that question? Well, since I brought it up, um, in some respects, the, I, I'm trying to figure out the, the right way to, to talk about this, and I don't want to be just Monday morning quarterbacking, but in, in some respects, um, the Obama administration really should not have backed off on the gas tax way back when it was, you know, when we were running out of funds for the Highway Trust Fund. If we had indexed or pursued, you know, a dime and gotten, you know, a nickel, out of it, he would have had his he would have had his his billions easily, right? And we would have been able to to hit you know at least cover up some of the deficit. And if we you know sort of cut back a little bit on highway funding or other things within in the program, you know we wouldn't have it wouldn't have looked as fiscally dodgy as it ended up looking. I think. And ultimately, I think the Republicans did a very good job at at making this look like another instance of finance of fiscal responsibility. I don't see it that way. But I do see this very much as intentionally political on, on the part of the Republican governors to, to paint this as a um, large-scale project that you know, doesn't have a, the financial heft or forethought that it should. And as a result, it became very, very easy for, you know, when the Republicans came in and when the budget went to the Congress, it became very easy for them to argue that this was not a good and sustainable plan. And uh, it was, you know, partially politically motivated, but also there are those questions about where the money comes from once you get it at the state level. There are plenty of people, and I think California's done a, a very good job of planning for this, a much better job than the federal level has. But people remember, right, that there are very nice subway projects that have not gotten built in Massachusetts because the big dig ate everybody's lunch at the state level. And so when you have those kinds of memories, these kinds of arguments from these Republican governors become much more powerful, even when people believe in what you're doing, even when people believe your project is a good one. I mean, I would add simply that the public is woefully unaware of the quantity of federal subsidies that go to airports and go to roads and are somehow under the impression that not building high-speed rail is, is, is a neutral act rather than a continuing massive, massive subsidy of these other modes. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing, is that I'm not exactly ignorant of them, and I'm still confused about what the vision for high-speed rail looks like. I mean, it, it makes sense, right? As an industry and as an infrastructure, it's probably going to operate much in the same way as airlines do, right? So some stations can more than pay for their own way, and other places will have to cross-subsidize. So, you know, that kind of stuff internally happens within the system all the time, but if we don't have you know, we, we've said things in California that I find deeply disturbing and that I would find deeply disturbing if I were a, a private finance person. You know, I'd be more than happy to, will, you know, run a service out of, out of San Francisco or, or, or um, Los Angeles, but I'd probably have to be paid, right? I'd probably have to have some sort of operating subsidy to operate out of Cochrane. If I were a private investor and we've sort of said, oh, we're not going to do that, we shouldn't have said that. No, it's, a it's, a, it's a legitimate use of, of public funding to, to try to bring access to places that are not profitable in network goods. Yeah. Okay, a question for you specifically, Lisa. Um, I appreciate your discussion of the trade-offs in the context of the, the uh, budget crisis at various levels of government. Practically, what do we do about that? How do we... How do we make sure that high-speed rail funding is, I, I suppose I interpret this as, is coming out of highway funding or coming out of the military budget rather than out of education and the, the social safety net? What's your practical solution for some of the problems you raised? I think that politicians need to stop being so scared of taxes. I think that they're wrong. 
when they say people will not approve taxes. We just approved a tax, again, in Southern California, Measure R, uh, particularly for transportation purposes. I think the difference is that people are, this notion that uh, Professor O'Hare brought up of people being very cynical about our leadership. I think both on the left and on the right, people have the perception that everybody uses their money for things that they don't approve of. So on the left, they're complaining about the war. On the right, they complain about welfare, and everybody looks at government as a, as a time waster and a, a waster of money. And this idea of connecting, of creating a critical nexus between what you're using the funds for and where they're going seems to be something that has worked at the ballot box as difficult as it is because ballot box budgeting is extremely dangerous. It does help people understand the connection between what you're taxing them for and what you're, what you're benefiting them with. Uh, Mike Burnick, if the major uh, job impacts of high-speed rail are indirect, they're not from they're not from the construction, but they're from the the changed geography of access. How does that work exactly? And 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 is there anything that needs to be done from a public policy perspective to maximize those benefits? Um, well, I, I I think there are three things. One, um, the um, the direct impacts are not insignificant. Um, you know, those are in job years, 17,000 uh, in construction, another 1,000 in terms of um, professional services. In terms of the indirect impacts, there have been a number of modeling attempts, in my view, not very convincing, um, that try to um, quantify what are the indirect impacts in terms of jobs and economic activity. Um, I think it's probably worth continuing to um, argue that point. To me, as I say, it's, it is very clear that is the main impact, linking the valley to the rest of the economy and the other efficiencies that come with high-speed rail. But uh, I, of the literature that now exists, I can't point to anything that I think is, is that good, but I think it's an effort worth continuing But so to. literally, how's that going to work? Does that mean Silicon Valley companies are going to open plants in Bakersfield that they wouldn't otherwise? Does it mean people will commute to Southern California or the Bay Area, what, what, explain a little what that increased geography of access looks well, like. Well, I mean, if you look at the literature, there are four or five factors that are looked up and looked at it in terms of productivity, uh, indirect impacts. There's the travel time reduction in terms of moving throughout the state. There's the reduction in terms of movement of goods. There's the, um, I think, as I say, it's, it's not that people open plants. Um, in the valley, though it will have that impact, Gabriel, of linking the valley, that is to say, right now, you can't get to Fresno. It, Jim and I were just discussing this. To get to Fresno is, you have to drive, basically. The, the flight, the um, airlines that 20, 30 years ago, you know, I remember taking, um, now are virtually non-existent. Um, so in terms of movement of travel, but there are four or five elements of that. Um, I can't point to a specific study, frankly, I think is, is convincing on that, but I think those are, the, those are the, the elements of economic growth you want to look at. Okay. Um, and then last, a question about the uh, child in the lake analogy. What do we do to um, help people um, see themselves in that, in that uh, altruistic role? Um, it's a good question, and I, um, there's, there's obviously no simple answer to it. Um, and I think there are some things we can do around the edges that would help. But one thing that strikes me is that I cannot remember a time when a governor of my state has used the word taxes and services in the same paragraph. And I'm not sure I can remember a time when they've been used together in the same speech. So this is enabling magical thinking and infantile behavior, right? If you allow people, oh, taxes, bad, low, don't want to pay taxes, you know, uh, preserve private consumption. Now, tomorrow, I want services. Service is very important with good roads. Um, I want to be able to get in my car alone and drive where I'm going and park free when I get there. And that's really kind of a part of my identity as an American. Um, there's no way out of this, so it's got to start with a fair amount of telling the truth. Now, there are various ways to tell the truth. Two couples, um, two couples in the East Bay can go to San Francisco for a show and park in a car cheaper than they can take the BART. 
And that's even assuming that they live close enough to walk to a BART station. And at that hour, the BART is not full. Therefore, the marginal cost of somebody getting on a railroad car that's already going across the bay is about zero. That's nuts, right? As long as we're mispricing, as long as we're lying, effectively lying to the public by subsidizing, um, by subsidizing road transport relative to other choices that people might make, then I think it's going to be very hard to tell the truth in a persuasive way because those signals are very important and we're, you know, occasion to look at them. Uh, it, you know, I mean, it's going to start with political discourse and it's going to start with some demonstrations, but it's a long, slow haul. And again, high-speed rail is probably not the most important place to be having this political debate. It's a, I, in my view, it's a relatively minor part of the larger project of freeing ourselves from the social capital destruction of an automobile habit. And that's what I'm really worried about. If you wear a two-ton car, any contact with any human being is bad. You never meet anyone not like yourself. And that's social dynamite. I mean, people who drive from socially demographic suburbs to socially demographic workplaces to a mall that was designed to cater to them never meet anybody who's not like them. We're hardwired to be afraid of people who are not like us. The only place in modern society where you can have the kind of encounter that reassures you that people different from you won't hurt you is on a street, on a city sidewalk, and in public transit. And as long as people don't have that experience, things will go downhill in the opposite direction. And we get things like Marin County voting out the BART because you know what kind of people climb out of a subway station, right? We don't want them here. Uh, it's part and parcel of the whole package. Okay, with that, let's close this panel. Thank you very much to the panelists. <laughs>